Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Acting Captain Charles Lara from the Special Projects Legislative Affairs Unit. We are here to satisfy uh, our community meeting obligations under the surveillance ordinance. Under the ordinance, all city departments must hold community meetings and seek council approval for all technologies that qualify as surveillance technology under the surveillance ordinance. The technology that we're profiling today um, is going to be uh, body-worn cameras. Uh, the technology is um, one of 75 other surveillance technologies that are already in use by the department. Uh, tonight's meeting is going to be simulcasted to eight other physical satellite locations around the city as required by the surveillance ordinance. I wanted to extend um, a thank you to the good people at the Anchor Church for giving us a place uh, to have this meeting to simulcast from. We're very grateful. And I also wanted to thank all the other uh, satellite locations for providing us a space uh, to do this presentation. Uh, the meeting will be recorded and uploaded to the department's YouTube page, which offers <clears throat> excuse me, closed caption translations in other languages. If you have a question or a comment, please fill out a speaker slip and turn it into the staff prior to the end of the upcoming PowerPoint presentation. We will provide one minute of public comment for each speaker. You can also comment by going online uh, to our technology webpage by using the QR code uh, at the signs uh, you saw coming in or going directly to the San Diego Police Department technology page. We are here to listen to all voices, either in favor or against the technology. Please be respectful of each other and differing viewpoints. The meeting will end at 8 p.m. sharp. Thank you for your kind attention. Allow me to introduce Captain Scott Wall from Operational Support. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out here tonight and, and sparing us a, a little bit of your time so we can talk to you about body cameras. Why are we here? Well, last year, uh, City Council passed the surveillance ordinance, which not only requires us to uh, disclose the surveillance technologies that we have, but also uh, come out and explain how we use them, the safety measures that we have in place, and uh, allow feedback, questions, and, and give us the opportunity to clear up, uh, clarify any uh, misconceptions or misunderstandings with the way that we're using technology. Each one of these pieces of technology uh, that we have over 75 pieces that we need to bring forward with this ordinance uh, really pushes us as a free society to that delicate balance of privacy rights and our civil freedoms and liberty on one side and balancing that with the need for public safety and uh, being able to provide uh, safety and security for, for everyone. So that delicate balance is really what brings us here today. I'm gonna start with asking you for your patience. Uh, we are police officers, we are not IT experts. We are trying a new process with this, um, this presentation tonight. Uh, we are live here uh, at the Anchor Church on Pentecost Way. We are also broadcasting simultaneously at eight other locations throughout the city, one in each council district. Uh, and so we wanna welcome the folks that are there at those locations. Uh, hopefully we don't have any technical difficulties. I think we're off to a pretty good start. Uh, but uh, as we do this, we're looking for the most expeditious way that allows one for you all to be uh, aware of the technologies we're using, provide that feedback, uh, but also not have to uh, be at nine locations with each piece of technology. That would be over 690 pieces of or, uh, meetings we'd have to attend uh, this year. So with that, um, I'm Scott Wall. I'm the commanding officer uh, of operational support. I have with me here tonight, Lieutenant Steve Waldheim, uh, Sergeant Ivan Garcia, and our body-worn camera administrator, Officer Ozzie Lowe. Uh, in op support, we, we really, we manage the logistics for the San Diego Police Department. All of the stuff, all of the things, the technology that we use out in the field, policing every single day, we're responsible for it, which means we have to test and evaluate lots of pieces of equipment, make sure that we're getting the safest, best products that are out there. Uh, we have to navigate through the procurement process, which is at times complicated and complex in the city, uh, but allows us to make sure that we're getting uh, a good deal, if you will, for the taxpayers' dollars that we're spending to buy this equipment. Uh, we manage the inventory of all the equipment. We issue items out to officers as they come onto the department, and as they leave, we get those items back. Uh, we fix items when they break down, uh, and if they're under warranty, we will send them back for repair. 
And lastly, we, we provide administrative support, uh, for example, uh, with programs like the body camera program. When officers come online uh, and join the organization, we have to give them an account with Axon or with evidence.com. Ozzy, that's one of the things he does for us, uh, is make sure that everybody has their account activated as they promote or move through different ranks and have different uh, levels of authority. He makes sure that those uh, their accounts are active with the, the right levels of uh, clearances. And when somebody leaves the department, he wants to make sure, or he makes sure for us that that uh, their accounts are, are uh, deactivated. We have been uh, using body cameras now uh, for almost 10 years. It's 2014, the end of 2014 is when we first started to deploy these cameras. Uh, and it's hard to believe that it's already been 10 years. It is woven into uh, the fabric of how we do uh, our policing here in, in the city. Uh, when I say it's woven into how we do things, uh, most of the police officers that are out in the field today don't know anything different than uh, wearing body cameras. Uh, that's all they've ever known. They've been taught in the academy from day one how to use uh, the body cameras in, in doing their day-to-day -day police work. And that's a, that's a good thing that we've come this far. In the beginning, it was very challenging for police officers that have been in the field for 5, 10, 15 years, maybe even longer, uh, having to learn that new muscle memory of activating their cameras uh, when uh, with each incident that they're involved in. So we've been doing it now for almost 10 years. When we got started, we were the first in the county. We were one of the first in the nation of uh, at least from the large agencies that are out there. There's good and bad with that. The bad is there's not a lot of uh, lessons learned that we could steal and, and use to our benefit. We kind of had to forge that ground and pioneer it all on our own. Um, we currently have about 1,000, let's see what, 1,740 body cameras uh, out in the field today. Uh, our current vendor is a company called Axon. Axon is the company we've been with since day one. They are the biggest or one of the biggest in the country. Uh, to handle an, uh, an organization of, of this size uh, is, is absolutely critical. Um, so that this system can operate without fail. It's not cheap. It's, we spend about $2.5 million a year uh, to have this uh, body camera program. And that number uh, is probably going to be in our rearview mirror uh, with a new contract that we're looking to get at the end of this year. Uh, as the cost for just about everything, as we all know, have gone up, uh, we anticipate this will probably increase a little bit as well. We do about 800,000 videos a year, substantial amount of videos that, that are collected, it's stored in the cloud. Um, since inception, since 2014, we've done over 6.3 million videos. The good news is we have unlimited storage uh, with, with the contract that we have. Uh, and don't expect that to change. However, it is it is expensive. Like I said we're we're, we're at about two point five million dollars a year. <clears throat> so why do we have a body camera program? Well, the intent uh, of what we're trying to do with our body cameras is we want to capture uh, our enforcement related contacts. we're We're not looking to capture me at lineup, having lunch, talking to my spouse on the phone, uh, at a community meeting. We're not recording that, that type of interaction or, or, or me driving down the street singing terribly out of tune. Those are, those are things that we're not looking to capture. Uh, what we're looking for is that enforcement-related interaction. And it provides for everybody. It's a protection for the police officers. It's a protection for members of the community. It provides us that extra layer of documentation and evidence as to what transpires in that interaction. And ultimately, uh, body cameras uh, help build uh, trust through transparency in the community as, as we're able to show with 6.3 million videos, uh, whether it's in court, um, really what's happening in those interactions. And from a, a 50,000 foot level, uh, I just wanna kind of talk a little bit about the nomenclature of how, how the cameras work um, for police officers every day. So the, the cameras are, are really a small, um, almost, smaller than, than a cell phone, uh, and they clip onto the front of police officers' uniforms. They wear them right about the center of their chest. Each day when they come in, they will take their camera out of a docking station. And the docking station is an important part of our program, important piece of this technology. That is where our cameras are, uh, the batteries are charged each and every night. 
and it is also where the videos are uploaded into the cloud uh, from the previous shift. So as officers come in, they'll put their camera on, they'll put it in what is called a buffering mode. That buffering mode is, um, well, sometimes it's a little bit confusing, but, but essentially it captures each moment in the two minutes prior. And it ca continues capturing that two minutes uh, as you work through your shift of video only, no audio. It's just video only. Again, the reason for that would be uh, it's not trying to capture my conversation, a consensual conversation with me and a member of the community, me on the phone with my spouse or um, anything else I might be doing throughout my shift. It's just those enforcement related interactions. If, uh, for example, uh, we're having a conversation and all of a sudden a bank robber runs by, I cl uh, click on the body camera, it will begin recording both audio and video at the same time moving forward. What that buffer uh, two minute period of buffering gives you is that context of what was happening uh, with that police officer just prior to that enforcement related interaction. Um, I know that can be a little bit confusing. So if there are questions about that, I'll be more than happy to help clarify that here uh, when we get to the Q&A portion. What are some enforcement related interactions? Um, traffic stops. Uh, if you're driving down the street and you're pulled over by a police officer for speeding or running on a stop sign, uh, that interaction is gonna be recorded. Uh, there's a likelihood, obviously, that there, there could be enforcement. Uh, if I'm driving down the street and I see somebody that I think is about to commit a crime, is committing a crime, or has just committed a crime, uh, and I stop and detain that person, we're gonna record that interaction. Obviously, if there's any type of call or incident uh, where there's going to be an arrest, uh, we will absolutely want to capture that interaction. For the most part, we are capturing uh, just about every single call that we go to, if there's any likelihood that there would be uh, an enforcement inter uh, interaction. Traffic accidents, for example, it says by nature that it is an accident that we're responding to. However, somebody there could be under the influence, and that could be the causal factor of the accident. Uh, so that we are recording from the moment we get that radio call. After each incident uh, that an officer uh, is involved in, they have to enter what is called metadata. Uh, they do that through um, use of the cell phones that we have issued for every police officer. They enter the descriptive information, whether it's a case number, an incident number, or event number, uh, maybe a traffic ticket number, or a suspect name. It's identifying information that helps us collate all the other uh, video that might be out there related to that event. Uh, it also helps us to recall that video a year or two down the road when, we're, when, we're, when we end up in court. <clears throat> Detectives. Detectives play an important part in this as they, uh, the following day or later that day when they, when they are assigned the case, any type of crime case or enforcement uh, interaction, First thing they're going to do is they're going to pull that video in. They're going to watch the video and, and make sure that we've got all the elements necessary for uh, the arrest that was made. Uh, detectives are also the ones that will uh, make sure everything is compiled properly and send it over to the district attorney or city attorney's office. Uh, and once it's over there, uh, all of our prosecutors also have uh, accounts with evidence.com, which is where we're able to pull that video out back out of the cloud and use it for court purposes. It is encrypted. Uh, I am, I'm not an IT person, but it is uh, encrypted uh, both when it is uploaded and when it's in the cloud and when it comes back down from the cloud. So how do we make sure that uh, our officers are compliant in using uh, these body cameras? First, I want to go back to what I had said a little bit earlier about, uh, you know, our police officers, the vast majority of them out in the streets today, have been trained from day one in the academy on how to use these body cameras. They want to have body cameras. It's a safety net for them uh, or a safeguard for them. Uh, but each month, we do have an audit system that the frontline supervisors are responsible for, uh, for each member of their squad or their team. Uh, and it requires them to pick two days, two random days out of the month uh, and review the enforcement related interactions that that officer had and the videos that should be associated with it to make sure that they've got the right um, amount of video and that they've recorded the video properly based on our policy and procedure. I did forget to say this earlier, but uh, 
our program, our body worn camera program is a, a procedure that we have. It's 1.49. Uh, you can find it online and peruse it uh, if you have not done so already. Uh, but it is it is the guiding uh, procedure, uh, department procedure that that really drives what officers uh, are required to do and what they should be doing in, in terms of using uh, these body cameras. So outside of the supervisor's monthly inspections, another uh, way that we would be able to determine if an officer is not using the body camera properly, uh, whenever you have an enforcement related interaction, whether it's an arrest um, or, or a, a ticket, uh, if it goes to a detective, the first thing a detective is going to do is look for that video. And if there's no video associated, they're going to ask the officer for the video. Uh, if there isn't an explanation as to why uh, there is a video there that that, that officer or that detective is going to inquire with the supervisor uh, and let them know that, hey, your officer is submitting, uh, you know, an arrest without any body associated body camera video. As soon as they send that case over to the district attorney's office or city attorney's office, the first thing they're going to try to do is look at that video as well. And so uh, you're not going to get a case issued in court today uh, without having uh, at least some sort of justifiable reason. And there are reasons why you may not have the video recording. Uh, unexpected things could happen. Your, your safety and the safety of, of those that are around you as a police officer is, is, is of primary importance. Um, it's possible you're standing in line at, at uh, you know, 7-Eleven or whatever, and somebody comes in and, and, and robs a place, an officer, depending on the circumstances, might have to take immediate action to address that. Um, and it's possible they would not hit their body camera. We certainly hope that their um, muscle memory would have them do that so we can capture what the officer is seeing and, and what is being said. But it is possible if it's a life-threatening moment that um, they may not have an associated camera uh, uh, video with that incident. Uh, and, and lastly, we have uh, any type of uh, an allegation or complaint comes in and internal affairs is investigating. If uh, there's any enforcement related interaction with that investigation, and our internal affairs is going to identify right away that there's no video associated with that, uh, and that officer would be facing uh, potential discipline for that. Our disciplinary process is progressive. Uh, it starts with a written warning, uh, it moves up on a second occurrence to um, a uh, reprimand. Third time would be a suspension. Fourth time, uh, they would be facing possible uh, termination. Fortunately, we have not got that far, as best I know. Uh, um, like I said, it, it, this is this is a, a tool and a mechanism that, that officers today are, uh, they want to have with them uh, as, as they look at it as a safeguard for them. So with that, I know that was kind of, that was kind of quick, uh, 50,000 foot level. So I'm, I'm sure there are going to be questions out there. Um, so at this point, I want to open it up to uh, any questions you might have. Uh, just real quick, folks, I know that um, we, we have our speaker slips at the back. I didn't see that anyone had filled any anything out. I just wanted to ask uh, in the room, is there anyone that has a question and, or you have a, I see in the, in the, <laughs> I think that's quite all right. Um, um, hi, um, I have several questions. Um, maybe you have the answers, maybe not, but at some point. Oh. Sure, yes. Um, so the first one is around um, public access and how you all release information to the public, especially to if, if the point is to improve transparency. That's the first question. The second one is, um, do the officers get a chance to take a look at the video before giving a statement or do they give a statement and then only then are they allowed to take the video? So let me start with the second one first. Um, so officers, we per policy are um, instructed to watch the video before uh, they complete their report. Um, what our policy also uh, you know, stipulates or sta uh, states is that if there is a discrepancy in what you recollect, from the incident and what you're seeing on the video that you need to document that. It's important that well, I, I remember uh, the, the person made this action uh, before, but when I watched the video, I didn't, it didn't appear to see it captured on the video. You, you need to document that. Uh, so yes, they, they do watch the video uh, prior to writing reports. Um, and as far as releasing the video, that, that part is complicated. Um, 
we, we do we do want to balance the transparency, uh, but uh, we also want to balance due process with with videos and in and so that's kind of a a, a challenge uh, for us. Um, I know under certain circumstances, obviously, officer involved, involved shootings, uh, the chief of police does have the discretion, and and there's current legislation that's out there that uh, requires us to release certain types of video under certain time uh, time restraints. Um, for transparency purposes and to make sure that uh, the community, uh, particularly when there's uh, shootings, officer involved shootings that are involved, um, that that information is given out to the public. Um, and it kind of steps up in front of due process rights. But that's really the, the, the delicate balance with each and every video that we have. Uh, the chief does have the discretion to release those videos. Uh, other than that, Charles, is there anything on that? Obviously, um, these videos are, are treated as evidence, and so they, they have to be, uh, we have to follow the rules of evidence. With the, but again, uh, SB 1421, SB 16, AB 748, these are laws that we must comply with, and we have to produce all related materials. So a great deal of materials that pertain to transparency are already up on our uh, website, on our uh, mandated disclosures uh, section of our website. So a great many of those videos are already up on public display and uh, particularly so the uh, AB 748, wherever we use force that causes great bodily injury or death, or where we discharge a firearm, those have to be put up. So um, obviously, again, the officer's rights, the, the, the evidentiary issues, but a lot of legislation has been written such that these videos become, and that's why it's so important to have these videos, is to, to put them into play to increase that public trust. Thank you for that. Uh, next question is, how do you treat things like sensitive locations, minors, domestic violence calls, those sorts of things where you're capturing the video? Do you keep those for a certain period of time and then delete them? How do, the, how do you handle those? It was like a three-parter right there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you touched a little bit on, I think, uh, privacy issues. Uh, when we're in a hospital environment or when we're dealing with uh, somebody that has a mental illness and uh, one of our perk clinicians is is talking with that individual. We're not capturing that uh, those moments or those locations with video, unless uh, let's say we're in a, a hospital emergency room. We're not typically recording in that environment, but let's say somebody picks up a, a scalpel and starts to attack a, a nurse. Obviously, that's going to be an enforcement interaction that we do want to capture that moment uh, per policy. Uh, we want to make sure that officers are trying to capture only the person or people that are involved, and we're not trying to get anybody in a, in a room uh, or unrelated to that event. And as soon as that's over, again, we would want to go back to not recording inside those sensitive locations or those sensitive conversations. When it comes to domestic violence, sex crimes, um, elder abuse, child abuse, we do uh, want to have those conversations uh, recorded. Uh, for evidentiary purposes. Um, there are certain circumstances it, it, that are in, within policy that allow us, if the officer feels it's necessary in order to get um, a statement or to protect somebody, uh, they can alter the view of the camera to hide their face. Um, and then there's also ways in, in court, if that's something that's necessary, where, where uh, their face can be blurred uh, from, from view. You, uh, is the retention period the same for those? I forgot that's the third part. <laughs> uh, so the retention schedule varies. Um, minimum amount of time that we're going to store um, uh, any piece of evidence, let's say from a traffic ticket, it, it could be would be two years. Uh, I think we're at is it sixty days or ninety days on accidental videos? Sixty days. Uh, so if, if if an officer accidentally activated the body camera. Um, they would clear that through their supervisor. Their supervisor would take a look at that, make sure it was just an accidental video. That's something that we would now store for 60 days. Uh, but outside of that, any enforcement-related interaction, it can be a minimum of two years, and it could be up to unlimited, uh, depending on the nature of it. And, and there's a long list of, of scenarios in, in that retention schedule. Um, I do want to circle back to uh, we do have unlimited storage, so we're not necessarily trying. It's not like... My wife and my kids, we've got a certain amount of storage on our phones and that's it, no more pictures. This isn't, doesn't work that way for us.
Excellent. And just for those that are on remote locations, uh, our retention schedule is a part of the use report that is online for, for you to take a look at. Last question, I'll get out of your hair. Um, talk to me about auditing and oversight. Who is auditing how often? So each field supervisor, uh, each frontline supervisor that has officers that have body worn cameras, uh, they are required each month to like two days for each officer, uh, two random days, and look through those videos and to make sure that the enforcement related contacts and the videos are matching up and they're following procedure with uh, how they're videoing and, and, and covering uh, each event. So that's, that's what's in our inspection schedule throughout the entire department. Is there any external view? Okay, yeah. So, yeah, so there is, there's, um, not at this moment. There is not an independent outside. Thank, uh, you. thank you. All right. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so the just make sure I understand your question correctly. Um, are you saying that we carry a different camera in the field than what we're talking about here today? Oh. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So this is, that's actually a very good question that I, I, I probably should have commented on. Uh, this is the technology that we currently use what I'm presenting with you today, it is, it is an existing technology that we've been using now for almost 10 years, started in 2014. Uh, our contract just ended in the end of June. We have an extension to get through the end of this year. Um, and at which point we'll, we're gonna release a, a request for proposals from other vendors uh, and, and, and negotiate out uh, potentially a new vendor, maybe the same vendor, I don't know, but a new contract a new five-year contract, and um, I don't think I'm going too far out on a limb, but it is possible that the upgraded technology, upgraded phone, perhaps like a cell phone, maybe a little bit smaller, a little bit better camera, um, would be a part of that. But but it, that's unknown at this point because we have to go out to proposal. Um, well, I, we don't know. Until, until we have a new vendor, it's, it's hard to say. Um, we've been very pleased with the technology that we have, very good uh, clarity and quality of, of camera, um, and they've held up pretty well, very durable. Officer Brown here at PV Library. Districts two and six, and we have Catherine Douglas representing the Coastal Coalition with a comment. First of all, I'd like to thank um, the San Diego Police Department, particularly Captain Wall and Lieutenant Laura, for giving us all this information. I, I don't really have a question. I'd like to make a comment. The purpose of body worn cameras is to capture police community members' interactions, and the footage captured can be an invaluable tool for officers, prosecutors, and other in processing evidence and in the ability to provide a level of transparency with outside parties that was previously unachievable. In my opinion, the use of this technology is a no-brainer 
and it's incomprehensible that anyone would take issue with its use. I hope this tech, this particular technology will be uh, endorsed and it'll go forward to keep our entire community safer. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, yes, yeah, good point. Patient, appreciate it. Um, I know Pega mentioned earlier um, how uh, t statements are given. I just wanted to ask uh, in the event that there's a discrepancy, it's kind of recorded or it's noted, how is that reconciled or what happens if there's a discrepancy between what collected and what's on the body camera? Can you tell me a little bit more about the, the circumstance you're, you're referring to? You, are you saying that if an officer um, recalls a statement differently than what is said on the recording? Yeah, I believe you mentioned that that gives the officer a, a, a chance to at least identify the discrepancy. I just wanted to follow up on that. Mm -hmm. If there's discrepancy, how is that handled and mitigated? Is that something that's noted after the fact or is that part of like an investigation? I would, I would say it, all that depends. It depends on those circumstances. It depends on what the officer's recollecting. Um, yeah, I'm right up, Charles. I have field duty. So I wear a camera for when I conduct field duty. Sometimes what the camera sees is qualitatively different from what a human being sees. Say, for example, I'm executing a, 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 a PC-844 knock and notice. Hey, it's the police. We're demanding entry. The door opens. Now, the camera sees out at 169 degrees. Human beings see at 180 degrees. So if, if I, I see the door open, I've done my pre-briefing, and I see the target of, uh, of the arrest warrant standing in the door, as he opens the door and then tries to shut it in my face, I can see him because I'm looking at him with my head, but my camera is not panning with me. So even though I say in my report, I saw the subject of the arrest warrant, the body worn camera, because of the nature of how it's worn on the front, is not going to see that. I make sure that I address that discrepancy by saying, my head turns independently of my torso. I knew that this was the correct subject because I said, sir, you are under arrest immediately upon his trying to shut the door in my face. So obviously, these are very fact-specific moments. But remember, the camera sees differently in a nature that is different from me being able to articulate my head to the left and to the right. And so we need to account for the different ways that the camera sees and even how human vision changes when, it's, when, we, when we're under stress our vision narrows down very, very, uh, to almost like one or two degrees. We get auditory dislocation because of, because of stress. So all of those things factor into how we write a report versus what the camera sees. I hope that makes sense. Oh, it certainly does. And in the event that there may be, you know, say there was something that was said that's hard to recollect, or maybe the camera didn't catch it completely, just wanted to, are there cases where that may have come up and curious how that's been handled? All officers have duty uh, have an obligation to be truthful as part of our as part of what we do. Um, and where there are discrepancies and there's a complaint or there's some kind of a obviously internal affairs has their duties to explore what was recollected, how it was reported, um, and you know the officers have rights. So that's obviously though, as the, the good captain was saying, these officers a, a, we have 850 officers who have less than five years on, which is like the majority of our patrol folks right now. They grew up with these cameras, so. They understand how to how to how to how to know what's being recorded and work with that. And it, thank you, so, sir. Anything in closing? Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was a that was a, very, that was a brief meeting, uh, which uh, again I appreciate. It. I know it's very warm in here. I wanted to conclude by saying thank you to all the the staff operational support, uh, Captain Wall for being here speaking on behalf of the technology. Um, I wanted to um, I, we had. The one comment from one other division and uh, the, the, some of the other places were, were also lightly attended. 
So we're going to close out the meeting. I thank you all very much for your time and attention. And uh, we'll be back uh, with other technologies in the months that follow. Thank you so much for your time.